Good, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I hope you all can hear me. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. Um, gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, today's uh, event, um, curated, of course, uh, by my colleague and friend, uh, Phoebe Scott. Um, the exhibition uh, is located uh, upstairs, uh, just on level three, so please uh, you know, do, do, do make a trip upstairs. It's a fantastic uh, expression of, of different ideas uh, that she's been kind of developing for some time now. Um, I'm going to uh, read uh, my opening remarks, so, so please uh, forgive me. Um, since its inauguration in 2015, between declarations and dreams, uh, fondly known as the Southeast Asia Gallery here at the National Gallery, has constituted an attempt at generating an ideal sort of provincialism that refuses to submit to the homogenizing effects of the Europe-American master narrative of art. The long-term display features almost 400 works of Southeast Asian art, ranging from the mid-19th century to the present, and an evolving curatorium of various colleagues here at the National Gallery has systematically rotated over 100 works each year. In this pursuit, the Southeast Asia Gallery, as an exhibition, has sought to develop its own distinct capacities, drawing on crucial primary research and fieldwork conducted by the curators across Southeast Asia, Western Europe, the United States, and elsewhere. The intention has always been to contribute in a significant way to the future of what is now a shared story of global modernisms, or if we may say, the global experience of artistic expression. In this way, between declarations and dreams, lays claim to the Euro-American canon and its very complex futures uh, that await us. And it is by curating from this vantage point that we strive to decolonize modernism structures whereby multiple worlds may thrive simultaneously alongside anachronisms, hierarchies, and inequalities. It has been a year since we launched Dalam Southeast Asia, a project space within between declarations and dreams. During this time, the project space has enabled the curators at the gallery to engage with the challenges that were identified at the outset, ranging from the ability to develop newer sets of ethical paradigms that enable more inclusive measures for accessing art, to allowing the curatorial to really act as a space for hypothesizing an art history that is in some ways yet to come. So, so much of the work that we are actually seeing uh, at Dalam Southeast Asia is really in anticipation of a future more progressive uh, art history. Uh, so, it is very much a, a kind of a science fictional uh, adventure, if you ask me. By this, I mean that we're also constantly experimenting with modes of presentation within Dalam Southeast Asia. And so, this work you see around you upstairs is very much lodged in the present with a view of the past, but also gearing up for a future that is much more inclusive. The inaugural exhibition, The Tailors and the Mannequins, Chen Cheng Mei and Yu Kin, which ran from 29th October 2021 to 12th June 2022, generated turns that paid homage to the incredible lives both artists led and the array of materials and objects they left behind. For those who would like to refer to the details of the exhibition that preceded this, we have a wonderful e-publication that is available and we can share the, the QR code for that. The tailors and the mannequins also re-emphasize the role modern art museums must and will continue to play in facilitating the circulation of stories that are yet to receive sustained art historical attention. This is especially important in regions such as Southeast Asia, where due to various historical circumstances, the curatorial has led the charge often in writing art history via the mode of exhibition making. So in a way, exhibitions generate art histories rather than art history generating exhibitions. And this is very unique actually to, to Southeast Asia. This was achieved also uh, through, at least for that previous exhibition, through the tireless efforts uh, of the curator, Roger Nelson, who not only engaged the artists and their estates, but also a series of specialists in wide-ranging conversations that not only enable gaps to be filled in a meaningful manner, but also initiated the public into a vast realm 
of associated histories that pertain to forced migration and the ability of the Southeast Asian artists to display their art in environments where infrastructure was still in the midst of being formed. Moreover, the tailors and the mannequins pointed to the manifold lateral links between Southeast Asia and other regions across the decolonizing world, collectively known sometimes as the Global South, including Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, and beyond. As this process unfolded in the lead up to the duration du and during the exhibition via a series of public conversations, just as what we have initiated for this project, it became possible to reflect on the sovereignty often that curators and by extension public art institutions continue to exercise over the artworks they display. Especially when curatorial enchantment, if I may call it that, actively seeks meaning within the painting's subject matter, but also beyond the boundaries of the artwork whereby circulation and distribution is seen as an endearing facet of how one may consume the work of art today in our time. This means that the authorial agendas of the artwork may be sublimated into a demonstration of contemporaneity, whereby the curator acts as an agent who resides within and at the edge of the culture that delivers the subject matter and context for the art. This brings me to today's event. I'm not going to say much, as Phoebe will be sharing more uh, in just a little bit. But at the outset, uh, I just want to emphasize that this project has been an immensely important journey for Phoebe, as she systematically engaged a range of individuals, collectives, and communities to think about the gallery's internal processes of cataloging, recording, and presentation. Some of those individuals are here uh, with us uh, today. In this regard, I want to draw your attention to the intervention Familiar Others makes into the conventions of museum labeling and cataloging. It is long known that museum labels are far from objective. This exhibition systematically highlights how indeed a more inclusive approach to museum labeling can be undertaken by the modern museum. This is achieved, uh, at least from my point of view, in two ways. First, the artwork labels show how one painting may be known by more than one title. Sometimes these titles were given by the maker or the artist, and sometimes descriptions were given by the catalogers who came to register uh, these titles. The second key intervention is the inclusion of thinkers, poets, writers, and activists who respond to the artworks as they attempt to reclaim or even challenge what is represented in the paintings and photographs. With that, I wholeheartedly welcome our speakers today, Gavani Domogo Gaungan, Kule Grassi, and of course, Pauline Fan. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's a real pleasure and looking forward to hearing from you all. For the moment, I just leave you uh, by recalling the vision we had set up for Dalam Southeast Asia, a space for reflexivity and experimentation a place for deep insights into the gallery's collection, its evolving collection, but also most importantly to challenge what a collection's display may potentially look like. So before I hand over uh, to Phoebe, uh, just a quick note uh, to thank everyone who's been involved in getting this event together and also the exhibition. Uh, Lynette, uh, especially um, Anissa Rahad, who is also somewhere in the, in the public, uh, for all her curatorial uh, contributions to the research. Um, so yes, uh, with that, welcome, uh, and uh, please uh, enjoy uh, today's session. So over to Phoebe. Thank you. thank you everyone so much for being here, and, and thank you Mustafa for those opening remarks. Um, because this is the opening event of the exhibition, I also want to take the opportunity to, to say a few thank yous and to acknowledge some of the people who worked on the show who are here, uh, especially Anisha Rahadinincias, who is a phenomenal researcher for the exhibition, Hafiz bin Osman, whose impeccable eye is always very helpful in the installation period, of course Mustafa, who's a phenomenal interlocutor for the exhibition as well, and all of the exhibition team, Lynette and the curatorial programs team and the events team for making today possible. I'd, I also really want to acknowledge the family of the artist Ye Chue, who were very supportive of this exhibition and lent materials and archives to the show. And uh, I think we're particularly courageous in, given the experimental nature of this project, in their openness and, and generosity. 
And finally, last but certainly not least, I'd like to acknowledge the, and thank the group of writers who were commissioned to create the response text to the artworks, which appear as wall text in the exhibition. Um, their contribution has been extraordinary and galvanizing, um, and I, I really think they, they make the exhibition what it is. So of course, to Gawani Gongen, Kole Grassi, uh, and Pauline Fan, who are with us today, but also to, to the other writers, um, the academics, Dr. Waylon Jahom, Dr. Els Tenike Rike Katmo, curator Enrico Yori Kondologit, singer-songwriter Elena Morang, and the artist Rocky Kajigan, and Diki Takandari, Betty Adi, and Michael Yan Davis of the Artist Collective Udaido. So today we'll be hearing live readings of two of the texts that were written specifically for the exhibition. So I'd like to just take a moment to explain how these texts came about and, and what it is that they're related to. This exhibition is about the representation of the other in Southeast Asian modern art, where the sense of the other might refer to a community, a culture, or a peoples who are somehow perceived as being different from the majority. The image of the other is something that appears very frequently in modern art, not just in Southeast Asia, but across the world, and particularly in the Euro-American tradition of modern art as well. Artists in the modern period drew inspiration from cultures that they did not necessarily belong to, representing images of others, as well as often using their visual or material culture as aesthetic inspiration as well, as the basis for modern style. This practice is an intrinsic part of the history of modernism and part of its creative energy, and yet it leaves us with a difficult legacy as well. Often the gaze on the other brought with it certain kinds of associations, ideas about the other that were exoticizing, stereotyped, and in the West such images are also often associated with the dynamics of colonial power. In Southeast Asia, the context is different again. Modern artists and the people that they depicted might share a stake in the anti-colonial or national struggles of the region. They might be joint participants in the emerging regional imagination of Southeast Asia. Artists might share personal or political ties with the people or cultures that they represented. And this idea is the basis of the exhibition, Familiar Others, the kind of grappling with the idea of self and other, intimacy and distance, uh, difference and yet kind of shared stakes. The three artists who whose work is highlighted in the exhibition, all manifest this dynamic in their life and work. Emilia Sanasa, a modernist painter active from the 30s to 50s, made images of peoples from across Indonesia, but was especially interested in Papua. She was active in the movement for Papuan independence from the Dutch, but also made her own personal political claims over Papuan territory. The pioneering photographer, Eduardo Masferre, took photographs of the diverse indigenous communities of the Cordillera region of the Philippines, creating a dignified and yet also a romanticized image of the region. Finally, Ye Chiu Wei, a painter of the Chinese diaspora active in Singapore and Malaysia, traveled throughout Southeast Asia as part of his activities of the Ten Men Art Group, but was particularly drawn to images of the peoples of Sarawak and Sabah, where he had made several trips. Yechue had also been a young child in Sarawak, and his works about this region seemed to layer his own personal history as well as references to the Chinese cultural tradition. So the work of each of these three artists leaves a very layered, complex, and interesting legacy. And when approaching the exhibition, we felt conscious that in order to approach this legacy, it had implications for our own museum practice as well. And it soon became apparent that more voices than the exhibition curator or the institution itself were needed to uh, interrogate this legacy in some way. So over the course of about a year leading up to the exhibition, I contacted writers, artists, academics, musicians, researchers, all of whom had community ties of some kind to the people who were represented in the artworks. And because of COVID-19, this happened in a very peculiar way. You know, none of us met face to face. They couldn't see the works in person. They couldn't see the exhibition space. So I have to admit there was a lot of trust extended as part of this process. Um, but we managed to do it using Zoom, email, high-res images. And the form of response was very open. It could be prose, poetry, it could be creative, it could be more critical or analytical. Um, and the brief was uh, to kind of respond in some way. So it could be personal, it could be um, subjective, or it could be based on an existing academic body of knowledge. 
All of the people who were invited to write were cultural producers of some kind in their own right, and they brought to bear their own bodies of knowledge, as well as their own um, personal understanding, in many cases, of the creative process itself. The full responses can be read in our exhibition catalogue, and extracts of the responses have been used on the walls of the exhibition space in place of curatorial wall text. So in fact, they, they replace the curator's extended label artwork descriptions. So yeah, thanks you all for <laughs> making my job much easier. But in fact, what came back through this commissioning process were eight unique responses which were thoughtful, generous, critical and nuanced, and really became the highlight of the exhibition. So this is the, the contextual basis of the two pieces that we're going to hear today. The respondents also had the option to write back in a language other than English. Um, and the two writers today did just that, uh, writing in Kankana'e and Iban, respectively. So what we'll hear today is two of the poems in their original language, followed by their English translations. And after that, we'll have a kind of panel discussion about the exhibition, about the works themselves, and some time also for questions from the floor. Okay, so finally, at last, I would like to begin by, by introducing our first writer and her work. Uh, the first reading is the work Akin Biang, or Whose Turn, by Gawani Demogo Gaungan. Gawani Gaungan is Kankana E. Igoro from Sagada, the Philippines, also the hometown of the photographer Eduardo Masferre, whose works are in the exhibition. In 2015, she won a Writer's Prize from the National Commission for Culture and the Arts for her poetry in Kankana E. And she's also contributed writings to anthologies of literature in regional languages, published by the NCCA. She's a participating poet in the Agam Agenda, an initiative for creative uh, research towards climate change action. And she's also been active in grassroots research and community development work. She now also works as a project development officer for the Department of Agriculture. So Gowani is responding to, can we see the work? Uh, the photograph Banao by Eduardo Masferre, which you can see on the screen. Uh, so she'll read the Kankana A version of the work, and she also prepared uh, an English language version, which I'll, I'll follow up by reading. So please join me in welcoming Gowani. Thank you. Akin biang, sinudwani nan munsus uwa, nan kainudian ay anak di sin asaway binayan dilayus. Ay nang tainan sin ili tatok nunay kikwaniya na. Nan nang sukat is nga danaya nan kalina, nan inmuna ay nang isukog is dua ay munsas pe ay ili, ay mun padara ay mang ijas biag bakon tutoy. Ay mang ipabalas anak ay an anawa nan kukwada. Nan nang unod isan malusan di ginawang, nang dasan sin baybay ay widan, ay mang unog sin amin ay danum yamang ipabala kasin. Nan nang unod isan magapuan, nan munlugyan di munlayog, tabubuyaan na ay minsulpuan di maidyawada, nan pengpeng ay munlugyan di wanad. Sinudwani nan munsusua, nan mundadaan sin luta, Nan manluluga na'y umay, sin umayan na, nan makatayaw, nan gumdang, sikad andi malungag ay makitutiyas na to'y. Nan nasasaminto, nan dadaano na, nan matatago, ya masiksikun, nan wanwan dun da. Ay masapol, makapkapatan ka na yun, amud no pa nag-uudan. Nan nandaan ay saka-saka, is namingsan, nan nansasaka-saka ay nandaan, is masinagaw, nan nandadapan, Sin matataguan na nabangasan, na nang sisinilas ay naidya wano nilakuan na, san wada sinilas ya sapatos na, san nangina, san makapnus kwalto nan gamang diikina. Sinudwani nan mansusua, nan manlalutok is wising, ay mang basa is timpo sin agaw, sin alinaw, sin buwan, nan manbugawan di bisbisting nan kailian di kuyat, Nan manlililu sin kinigid ay kludung na. Nan nagagaduway agaw na suuras minuto ya segundo. Yanan nga dan sin kaaga-agaw. 
Nan manggagoon iswa ko na idatdatang wano na isukat, tay mabalin mong swa ko ng lalaki at babae. Nan maliklatoy ng gagoon iswa ko, nan mangpuputput islapisin makanawan, siyas naway ay duay imana, nan maid naway ay imana. Sinudwani nan mong susua, nan mabilang nan tawon sinangas na, nan adado nan amang yang isiyot na, Mang itok islinyan di muging na, siya ay mang pintor isubil na, sinangas na, nan umagyat ay maeteng, nan maidnguto na, siya ay mang kutis subil na, taman ayag, wano sumungbat taman suot, nan paginok si man aga, wano man nga ba, siya ay man ikiyat at madngu, nan mang iyaga is adu ay kayat na ikanan, ay mang iipo is agada. Sinudwani nan man susua, siya ay mang tukiskalin di na nudtudu, nan mang tukiskalin di tukun ay ili, nan makakalias dua, tulu ya ulay pay upat ay kali, siya ay mang tuksikalin di batawa. Tabakan ko dong digin masingan di ipugaw nan mang tuk, ay nugin masing us nan batawa kong natako. Nan makatuyas di sikya ginawang mang tukiskalin di danum, amud nulumigot, wano sakbay man ipukay, sakbay maudi nan babawi. Siya'y makaawat iskalin di kuya at wano alingo. Tamasuot kad ng kadanda. Yan nun to'y ibada. Nan makiibaga no apay nga adi tumubun umadunan pa yun. Nan makaawat sin adi makaikwani. Nan makaawat uray maidkali. Yan nan mansardungan di ba ut di kan kanan. Sinudwani nan mansusuanan in ina. Nan mangingisit ay ungunga. Nan napaptik ay mangitit ay lalaki. Ay maamamud numisnud si nalaki mun pulaw ya piduay ka atak dagna kagapul gadela. Nan inay am ada, nan an akda, nan apuda, nan apuda stumeng nya dapan, ya nan puliday nang lipat kenda ida, nan nang laylayad kenda ida nan agay, nan mang mangtek kenda ida, nang pakpakan kenda ida, wunun nang lagbu kenda ida, wunuway nan lagbu. Nan nang suot ya nang dudengu istadad at da, Nan agay pulos ng sasagang kanda ida, nan nakaila kanda ida, sindingding. Whose turn? Whose turn is it to speak now? The last child of the couple who survived the flood, who left the village for a different story, changed her name and spoke another language. The first who carried two warring villages in her womb, who shed blood to give life, not death, and brought forth children to a wider territory. She who followed the river downstream and found the sea a wide porch where all waters end and begin again. She who went upstream where the flow begins to see where nothing becomes something, where the dot becomes a line. Whose turn is it to speak now? She who walks on earth, who rides to get where she has to go, who flies, who crosses the spirit world to talk to the dead. She who walks on paved roads, who walks on pathways that are alive and growing, that have to be trimmed regularly, especially on rainy months. She who walked barefoot once, who walked barefoot for a day, who walked barefoot for a lifetime, whose heels have cracked. She who wears slippers that were given or that she bought. She who has expensive slippers and shoes. She who has a room full of footwear. Whose turn is it to speak now? She who wears a bracelet made of brass, and tells time with the sun, the shadows, the moon, the sound of crickets, the sight of birds. She who wears a watch on her left wrist, whose days have hours, minutes, and seconds, who has names for the days of the week. She who holds a pipe, given or bartered, when men and women owned pipes and were photographed with pipes. She who grips a pen in her right hand, who has both hands free, who has no hands free. Whose turn is it to speak now? She whose age is counted on her face, who laughs and smiles a lot and shows off the lines on her forehead. She who paints her lips, her face, who is afraid of getting old, who is unafraid of getting old and doesn't care. She who moves her lips to call or to answer, to ask, who hushes the crying and the noisy. She who glares and commands compliance, whose tears speak volumes, who holds back their tears. Whose turn is it to speak now? She who knows the language of her ancestors, who knows a foreign language, who speaks two, three, even four languages. 
she who knows the language of the earth. For we can only say if we were happy here on earth, but not if the earth was happy with us. She who speaks with creeks and rivers knows the language of water, especially when it's angry or before it lets go, before regrets are too late. She who knows the language of the birds, of wild pigs, to ask them where they are now, where their kin have gone, who can tell why the oak trees don't reproduce. She who understands those who cannot talk, who understands silence and the pauses between words. Whose turn is it to speak now? The old lady, the smiling younger woman, the short, dark-skinned man, more so when he is next to the fair-toned man twice his size, standing like a meter stick. Their mothers, their fathers, their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, and their descendants who forgot about them. Those who loved them, those who didn't, those who knew them, fed them, those who paid them, who earned, those who asked and listened to their stories, who never met them at all, who saw them on a wall. Thank you very much. Oh. So I'd like to introduce now uh, for our second reading, uh, Kule Grassi. Kule Grassi is a poet, singer, songwriter, and visual artist of Iban descent from Sarawak, Malaysia. He writes poetry primarily in Malay, interwoven with several indigenous languages of Sarawak, including Iban. And I understand that this is the first time for this exhibition that he's written a piece entirely in the Iban language, so it's very special. His first full-length poetry collection, Tell Me Can Yelang, Circumference Books uh, 2019, translated by Pauline Fan, was shortlisted for the 2020 National Translation Award in Poetry and longlisted for the Best Translated Book Award 2020. He has been featured at several literary festivals, including Singapore Writers' Festival and Georgetown Literary Festival. He founded and curates Nusi Poetry, a creative platform for Borneo indigenous poets, and is the co-founder of avant-garde Sarawak music group Nadine Rhapsody. Kule Grassi recently led an indigenous music project called Kule Comrades to perform at the Sami Pavilion Venice Biennale 2022. So Kule will be reading the Iban version of his work, um, but it's also been translated into English by Pauline Fan. Pauline is a writer, literary translator, and creative director of the cultural organization Pusaka. Her translations of poems by Kule Grassi were shortlisted in the United States for the 2020 National Translation Award in Poetry. Pauline's literary translations from German to Malay include works by Immanuel Kant, Rainer Maria Rilke, and Paul Salan. Pauline is also director of the Georgetown Literary Festival, Malaysia's largest international festival of literature. So Kule has responded to this work by Yechue behind us on the screen, and I'd like to invite him to, to come and read the work now. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> so, before I share my response to the work, I would like to share one line, probably a hope, from my ancestor, a line. <clears throat> eh. Yahindae tak sidung kadang yang mah. Menati ke sida aki ini kudah parai sulai ngada. Nge aku dia tu sebana agi belala. Nuan benua alai sidaya parai eh ya indai nyawai so that's her weep before she passing so this is nile nda ala desliah ke penumbuh pisang unai 
ditaban ke nyumbuh rawah-rawah nak makai selemai-lemai dia kita ninga sedang-sedang kupa nando ampang tengkembang sepeda pulai hari malik jadi siang oh ayah ayah yeah. nama nuan nusi utai belalai baka nengah mungguk madang kemba palan terlebak kena ngagak ampang tengkembang Ngetu dulu kita melihat ujud dengan nak temeran. Ngai ke tersinta uwi semambuk bak ujung tanjuk. Ngetu dulu kita mucau ke semadak naban ke upak. Ngai kena ampit emperan besai tumbuh rian belangsai. Lemai berbungai pagi berkeberai muai ke tupang. Angkat dulu kita. Berarti ke mata Cina nengalih kari lemainya di petang. Bedau temu semaya tang sigi ampit dirintai keturai ngelingik Singapura. Pihak yang usi hujan bertemera labuh ngaya ke mata. Nyepik kenyamai belalai dari penjansa manua. Tusi baru dini nuan nyinta tatum seduai yang kudu. Bergelumuk sidak sebuat nganti penatai nendak nusui cerita baru. Pihak yang rekau-rekau anak patu balu Ngini yang buah si bau nanti yang ruai Sida apui penglima orang kaya sibu Suah nepan entukar langit biru Lalai kemagang aweh Sigit bedau temu randau seduai tuai hari sibu Kadanya utai selurik nuan maya sindau-sindau Bak rantau jalai pakan Tau pen Semangat lelang nuan di kaliah kebun sumalam je nak tindu wak berpenepan tilam kerangan. Raya penglamak nuan nelak cerita sidak negerinya di lambah pica. Ukai ngai nengalik diri. Laban semaya tuk bedau bisik berbuah. Ya nuan lesi aku bedau ada. Amat pen mayuah. Landiak jauh. Sekolah negeri jauh Amerika. Dan berdau, berdau mayuh anak ucuk ini Sidak anduran rindu ngecuk lambar Empat raja mata Raya pengelama Nuan ngangau lalu nesau Bakal mepat bemban Jadi ketikai senawari Nala hati janik nak tahu ransik Bakal anak mi terjun ke pendai Tang pihak pengelama Nak mantah Nak nujah Laban mata nuan Nak bula nusi kedengah Nyak lai Nak temu kemaya hari penembuk nuan rebah Mantang ke jari Bak syukur dia Thank you Glance You can't elude the grove of pisang unai Forbidden fruit seized by squawking macaques Ravenous since evening Then you hear kupa weeping without end as the bastard child Ampang Tengkabang appears before the day dies to return to the dawn. Oh, why, Aye, why do you tell of hidden things like crossing the Limba Highlands where we gather the blood sap of Ampang Tengkabang? Stop for a while, all of you, coiling your baskets with Tamaran so that you won't get snagged by the Samambo rattan at the edge of the veranda. Stop grumbling for a while about the black jungle ants scavenging morsels of bamboo shoots. There may still be time for the empty earth to bear durian balangsai, its dust blossoms scattering at daybreak towards the mouth of the Ketupung. Get up, all of you. Let's look at the eyes of this Chinese guest turning day to dark. Who knows when, but there will be time to wind the Turai script around Singapura. Like erratic rainfall leading our eyes astray, he finds himself at ease, glancing from the window of a world. Tell us again where you forage for Tatum and Nkudu. Everyone is gathered here, awaiting the arrival of the Nandak omen bird with another fable, the orphan pleading for rambutans hanging in the ruai, or Apoi, the commander, rich man of Cebu, who rides on metal birds in the blue sky. 
Conceal it all away. We know nothing of the words you exchanged with the elders of Cebu. Perhaps you encountered something as you roamed, sleepless, somewhere near Pakan Road. Or your lost soul was transformed by the night of the sun as you slept soundly upon stones and shells. How long you watched their stories unfolding into paper images. It's not that I wish to keep this pleasure for myself, but before this, there was no reason, for you are departed and I was not yet born. Many of them are clever, schooled far away in America, yet there are so few who inherit the path of the true artist. Enturan paints the layers of a rainbow. What took you so long to find me and proclaim yourself? Like harvesting mengkuang leaves to weave tikar for sandal ari offerings, the divination of the pig's heart, one can't be sullen. Let's be like children diving from a cliff. Though it took a long time, there's no resistance, no clearing away the jungle, because your eyes do not lie to express our noble narratives. That's why we don't know when your creations will vanish. You anoint your canvas with fingers blessed by your tongue. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Gawani, Kule, Pauline, um, for those wonderful texts for the exhibition, but also for the the effort of coming here and reading them in public, and I think, you know, like all poetry, they, they gain so much from being read aloud. And I also want to say that I, I particularly appreciate the, the epic journey that some of our, our guests have made to, to be here in Singapore today, so thank you so, so much. Um, so as you can imagine, receiving these texts in my email inbox in the course of an ordinary day at National Gallery Singapore was uh, some of the most exciting emails I've ever received. <laughs> And really, I think the poems are quite mesmerizing works, and in reading them the first time through, I, I really had the chills. Um, and, you know, as with so much poetry, the, the meaning is elusive and subtle and manages to grapple, I think, with many of the, the issues raised by the exhibition without needing to offer a very straightforward or simplistic resolution. So I'd like to take a moment you know, to, to speak with the writers and, and to draw out some of the relations to the image that, that the poems offer and, and the reasons for, for their approach. I guess also when I read these, it, it seemed to me that both of them were grappling with a very problematic and difficult issue, which was the task basically that I'd set them, which was to speak for an image from the past with which you know, they have some kind of relation, but in, in many respects a, a sort of notional and abstract relation. So the challenge of writing in the present, but, but speaking for an image in the past. So I wanted to ask about that first. So perhaps, Gowani, we can, we can start with you. So in your work, there's, there seems to be an interplay between two women, you know, the two kind of she who, she who does this, she who does that. And perhaps this is about um, the dynamics between, you know, the woman in the photograph and then a contemporary woman such as yourself, you know, writing for her, speaking for her. So can you say more about why you chose to approach the poem in that way? Um, I guess um, I wanted to draw out more possibilities of people or of women who could speak out and more diverse uh, voices to be heard or to be included. Something like that. Yeah, so... Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> why, why did you choose that image in particular? Uh, for one... Well, I, we're both indigenous and we both belong to the same region. But uh, in the end, I'm still just also someone who saw her on a wall. Um, yeah. uh, I chose the image because it was from Banawe. Although, she, yeah, uh, there's a bit familiar. I mean, there's familiar but also an otherness about it. So I think... I felt like I could respond more to it. And then, of course, she, she's a woman, so let the woman speak. <laughs> yeah. Did you, did you feel some hesitation about speaking on her behalf, in a way? Oh, uh, yes, because, yeah, yeah. Like I said earlier, uh, at the end of it all, I'm just someone 
who saw her on a wall. And there's so many different expressions of being indigenous. Um, like, yeah. <laughs> so for your title, you know, Whose Turn, it becomes a refrain throughout the poem. Why, why did you choose that title in particular? Um, it's more of like, more beyond what is being spoken or who is talking, but also who is given the chance to talk or to speak or given the space or who are we listening to. So it's more beyond like that. Yeah, and, and something that comes across in the exhibition as well, you know, in, in some of the archival vitrines that, that support the artwork in the show, uh, we have some images about the history of photographic representation in the Cordillera as well, when there was very much a sense, particularly in the 19th and early 20th century, that these were peoples who were heavily documented by others, who had others constantly kind of representing and speaking for them, especially in the American colonial period context. So when I read your work, I was very kind of excited by the idea of, you know, whose turn, whose turn, because it seemed a particularly urgent question in that historical setting. So. For Kule, your, your text also grapples with this problem, and in particular, it seems like it's trying to think through what an encounter between your ancestors and the painter might have been like. And, and this is, I guess, another device for, for dealing with the fact that you're writing about an image of the past in the present and kind of speaking for an image in the past. So why did you, why did you take this, this approach of kind of imagining this encounter? Um, so basically, when I when I when I was given the task, I was asking myself, "What is your role in life?" To to give what's the best from your community instead. So by using me as using me, I mean as the mediums as a tool to tell the story. I think I would just use uh, barely the sense that was given to me to respond to it, the, the words, the works itself, which I think it, the, the response was naturally out poetically. So when you talk about the, the poetry world, it was a silence world that no one else wanna go instead. So I think by responded to that, it, it called me naturally to have a, a long conversation spiritually with the work. So back to that again, when I, I was given the task, I, I, I admit it was quite hard because uh, to choose any of the work because it was all, all amazing, amazing. But... Uh, the piece that I chose was quite um, interrupt me at first because this how the state of mind of the artist of the indigenous itself talk when I saw that. So without any hesitation, I cho I choose the work and I started to have this little small conversation to talk instead of just uh, straightly go and probably Google or do some research about uh, Ye Chi Wei. But I think I want to understand the energy that, had li that he left in the work. So that's how I respond and why I choose that. Yeah. And in, in the poem itself, it's also talking about the idea of knowledge that has been revealed, but also knowledge that has been concealed. Um, and then sometimes you're even, the, the poetic voice is even saying, you know, conceal it, conceal it, like don't, don't tell the hidden things. And I thought that was very compelling as well. So I wondered, you know, when you, when you saw the artwork, and I think you shared with me that you had a sense that the painter had received knowledge in some way, that there had been a kind of exchange of knowledge. And yet, I guess you also felt that there was some, some limitation to that, you know, some sense that things had been kept back as well. Can I ask you, what, what was it about the work that gave you this idea? Because first, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's all about the energy that he left. And I think that energy is uh, still 
uh, hauntingly beautiful because uh, from the image, uh, barely the image, I uh, it call my inner um, my inner soul that I know that some of the structures of the words are forbidden. So when he was there, witness or or just to pick to see the work, I might say that he is a uh, most um, respectful person at that time because as uh, Ipan myself, we want we are so territorial. We won't allow anyone alien to come to our place. You know, you may have heard about Hat Hunter, <laughs> all that. We are so territorial. So, if you can witness that in your mind alone, uh, or uh, or physically, I I I really believe that he is someone that is being respectful at the time. So I really, is, uh, I feel eager to, to know more what has been offered to him to come to the community and it took years for indigenous artists like me to respond to uh, representations of the indigenous scenario. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, just just on that point, because I, I think that's quite interesting, but to point out, um, so Kule, when he wrote his response, was completely unfamiliar with the works of Yechue. But, but for Gowani, I think the situation is quite different, because in the region where she comes from, Mass Fairy's works are very popular, well-known, heavily circulated. So I think this also kind of changes the conditions of the response, too. Um, but kind of going back to the matter of sort of sacred knowledge, revealing and concealing of knowledge, it's also interesting that that both of the texts incorporate kind of mythology, uh, some kind of ritual references, ancestral stories. So I wanted to elaborate about, about some of those. So Gowani, your text begins with this reference to the last child of the couple who survived the flood. So can you tell us what this story is? Yeah, uh, there is a common oral uh, story that sadly up to date also re remains largely oral. Uh, of the origin of a lot of communities from where I come from, where uh, the, the, the community was started by survivors of a great flood. So we get so many versions of these in communities and sometimes as many as there are storytellers. And one version is uh, this, um, the children of the survivors of the great flood the older ones settle in this community and the last child goes to that town where the woman in the photograph, Banawe, uh, is. So I find, I, I, I feel like I wanna hear that story also. Like what could have been her story? Yeah, why? Something like, yeah. <laughs> And then for Kule, I mean, there are, there are many references in your work to, to ritual and myth. In fact, so many that in the catalogue we have a glossary next to, <laughs> next to this particular work. But I wanted to ask about one because it's such a powerful line, you know, the, the last line of the poem. You anoint your canvas with fingers blessed by your tongue. Can you tell us what this is uh, referring to? Okay, so I repeat in, in the original, original text, it's, it, it sounds like this. Um, Nya alai nak temu kemaya, ari penembuk nuan rebah, mantang kejari bak sukut dila, mantang kejari bak sukut dila. I, when he spears his fingers in the work, it's like him allowing, allowing the blessing or even the curse to himself back and forth. If the works doesn't find the right way to survive. Is it, is it a moment of completion? That yes. That yes, it was. Um, 
So I suppose the, the discussion of cultural references in the work also necessarily leads to the issue of, of language. And I wanted to ask you both, you know, what the, the challenges are of, of writing in an indigenous language and, and why you choose to do it. And also in the sense of how these languages are generally used today, you know, where you encounter Kankane and Iban, Iban today. Uh, perhaps, perhaps you can start going. Um, I write in Kankanai because is it, it is so me and so us. It's the language that best captures our way of life, our worldviews, and our values. Um, we now, it's, it's largely oral. <laughs> yeah, it is oral. Um, I, we use it. Well, I have two kids, ages six and eight, so we use kankanai at home. Um, even if, like, some households would prefer to talk to their with their kids in English because it will give them a head start in life, I feel like, for me, um, they learn English anyway in school where they spend more years. And I feel like... Um, if we don't do this at home, we don't literally pass it on to the next generation. So um, I work with farmers, and every day we speak kankanai, but I'm also more uh, looking at like how does it get passed on to the next generation so that we get maybe a writer in kankanai a few generations from now, and they can dream in this language. As a, as a writer, does it offer you, I mean, is there, there any particular kind of aesthetic quality or technical quality that it offers you as a poet, Kankanae? Like something you can do in that language that yes, you can Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I feel like I'm more powerful in it. Like, uh, yeah, like I have all the tools I need to do whatever I want. Something like that. Kule? <laughs> oh, like, uh, basically why uh, some of the words left untra uh, untranslated or uh, why I, I, I chose Iban or some other indigenous language in Sarawak because I myself um, came from this uh, a huge cave of uh, different culture or assimilations of cultures in Sarawak. Um, we spoke few or uh, various ethnic language. I was sent to, to uh, a Chinese elementary school and how I think, uh, I, the language of my thinking is in Mandarin, but when it came out, it will be in my indigenous language or the Malay language. So I think I, it is hard way when, when uh, being, being a writer or so poet that you you have to choose one particular 100% uh, language to preserve that in one text. You know, for example, in English, you have you. There are some uh, terms or words that they can't be translated. You see, so I think um, it is also a struggle as I as I, uh, I as I believe the evolutions of the language. It has to be challenged. So, uh, together with the process of how we want to preserve it, it's also uh, the 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 evolutions of the language is also need to be challenged in the way that uh, how we weave the words or how we integrate other language in the word itself. So, yeah. And perhaps Pauline, you'd like to say something about the, the process of translating from Iban to English and, and some of the decisions, because in fact, in, in the English version, I think you already heard there are many untranslated terms and you know, how, how you made the decision to leave certain terms untranslated and yeah. So, um, first of all, to say thank you very much for having this conversation and giving us this opportunity. But um, I think the, this was also my first time translating completely from Iban. And so I've translated Kule for many years now. And of course, Kule writes in primarily Malay, 
and interwoven with several different languages, including Iban and including some other um, indigenous languages from Sarawak, Kayan, Kalabit, and others. Um, and so through the process of translating Kule's work is actually how I've picked up the Ivan language. And I do, not ex um, I do not consider myself an expert in Ivan by any chance, uh, by any t um, way, but I, do, I am somehow an expert in Kule's vocabulary. And this makes me able to translate yeah, Kule's <laughs> work um, from the Ivan. Um, and it is, for me, Kule's work is a very distinct kind of Ivan. Whether he's writing in Malay or whether he's writing in Ivan, it is a world on its own. And, and therefore, when I'm translating it, it's not simply about, it's never simply about the words. It is really about entering a landscape and situating and finding yourself in that landscape. And for this one, for, um, even from before, every process of translation of Kule's poetry is a kind of journey that we have to take on our own. And sometimes it takes many days and nights and sleepless nights of conversation because we actually enter a space where we're kind of traveling together. And it's always, I've always felt that it is moving through a landscape and I've really um, experienced the mythological world as well as the, um, as well as the physical world of, of Sarawak in this way. And so translating from the Iban for me was, we needed a lot of discussion, of course, um, because it's not, it's not even my third language, I would say, maybe it's my, I'm picking it up um, as a maybe as a fourth. But um, I think the familiarity with Kule's vocabulary was definitely helpful. The reasons in this particular piece, actually the, the ones, the terms that I left untranslated, many of them are words from the natural world. And so if I were to translate it, this probably there might be an English term, but it really probably doesn't sound necessarily poetic. And it doesn't, I think, for me, evoke the landscape or sensibility of Sarawak. And so I think leaving the word intact in Iban gives you much more of a sense of the worldview and the way that the community itself names things in their world. Um, and that's what I've done with, with Kule's poetry um, his previous poetry as well, it's also to allow the reader or the listener to read in a different way. I don't think reading and understanding meaning is necessarily gets you closer to the actual meaning of the work. It's not always about dissecting, particularly with poetry, you don't have to dissect it to a scientific explanation in order to actually grasp a poem. Sometimes to leave things um, a bit more unsaid, and to listen, even if to, to the things that are strange um, and unfamiliar, sometimes that brings you closer to a work than direct interpretation or translation. And I think there's something conceptually powerful about that as well, especially for a piece that, that talks about revealing knowledge or concealing it. So in a sense, you know, not having it completely translated is also you know, showing, really demonstrating that not everything is completely commensurate, not everything is completely knowable from, from a, another vantage point. So perhaps finally, you know, um, Gawani prepared both the English and Kankana A versions of her text, so she had to undertake the sleepless nights alone. <laughs> but do you feel, you know, the English reads very smoothly, and so it, it always makes me wonder, you know, what... Did, is something left behind in the Kankana A version that was untranslatable, or yes. do you find that it was it was easy to kind of prepare a version of each? Uh, well, for one, Munsus uh, Oa, which we encounter in all, all of the first lines, actually doesn't translate to just speaking, but I couldn't find the English translation for it because Susua is actually the spoken word of any of the traditional rituals which we still observe up to this day. And it's actually more than just speaking, it uh, tells a story of why it is being performed or where it came from or how, how it came about. And at the same time, um, what you call this? Yeah, set out intentions for the future. What, what do we want to do now and where do we want to go? Like for in a ritual, in naming, a, giving the ancestral name of a child, um, 
they 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 include a prayer to ask that the child be not afraid of the thunder of the rain or of the lightning or that there's food on the table to share something like that so it's more than just speaking yeah i can see from that description why there's no english analog for that specific term i mean it encompasses a lot well look thank you so much for for these these thoughtful comments and for your contribution to the exhibition and today um i'd now like to to offer the chance to our audience to to ask any questions that you might have they're too shy <laughs> Well, in that case, perhaps we'll uh, take a moment then to thank again um, Gawani, Kule, and Pauline. Thank you so much. And I'd, I'd also like to invite all of you to visit the exhibition. So it's kind of immediately above us. You can take either these stairs and come up um, on the right here or the lift behind you to go and see the show. And you'll see the kind of extracts of these texts on the walls. But of course, the, the full versions, including the versions in the original language, can also be accessed via the e-catalogue, which you can scan in the space or through the exhibition website. So yes, please um, join me in thanking them again for today, and thank you so much for being here.